Welcome to Where He Leads Me with Mike and Laura Harris. Where He Leads Me will help to bring understanding of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Join Mike and Laura as they discuss biblical truths to help people walk in their God-given purpose and calling. Welcome back to Where He Leads Me. I'm Mike Harris. And I'm Laura Harris. We're very happy to be with you today. And Laura, tell our listeners what we will be talking about. Mike, today we're going to be talking about the Holy Bible. Imagine (laughs) that. We talk about Scripture about every week, several Scriptures actually. And today we're going to be looking at how we came up with the Bible. That's right, Mike. So we're not going to be talking about a topic In the Bible today, we're actually going to be talking about the Bible itself today. We're going to talk about how the Bible that we hold in our hands came into being. And I think most people, most Christians don't even think about the process of how it came to be that we have a book in our hands that spans about 40 authors and about 1,500 years of writing history. We'll get into all of that. Well, Laura, I know the books of the Bible are broken up in sections that I know I haven't been aware of in the past, and I'm sure many of our listeners may not be aware of it. So, of course, obviously we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Laura, why don't you get us started with an overview? Well, Mike, the Bible is broken up into two main divisions, and the divisions that I think everyone would be aware of are the Old Testament and the New Testament, and there are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament, and really the Bible is not just a book, it is a collection of separate writings by separate authors. Well, Laura, we see that in the Old Testament, the new is concealed, and in the New Testament, the old is revealed. Well, Mike, yes, and what that means is in the Old Testament, there are types and shadows. There are allusions and references to things that happened in the New Testament, specifically prophetic words that point to the coming of the Messiah that we know is Jesus Christ. And the New Testament refers back to the Old Testament. So the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. And Jesus Christ said that not one jot or tittle shall fall away. Jot and tittles are marks in the Hebrew language. And so Jesus is saying nothing of the scripture shall fall away until till the end. So we are not a people of just the Old Testament. We are not a people of just the New Testament. The whole is the scriptural basis for our belief in Jesus Christ. Well, Laura, how is the Old Testament broken down? Well, Mike, it's so very interesting when we actually look at the books of the Bible. They are not random in their placement. It's very much an orderly division of the books. So the first thing that we see in the Old Testament is the book of the law, the Torah. And these books are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were deemed to be written by Moses. So Moses had the information certainly about Genesis and Exodus because he just came of age in Exodus. So he had the prior information which had been handed down to him by oral tradition. The first five books are known as the Torah, and that's the Hebrew word for law. So the book of the law, sometimes as it's referred to, or the book of Moses. Those are the first five books of the Old Testament. And those explain Israel's beginnings. That's right, Mike. So, Laura, what's the next set of books in the Old Testament? Well, Mike, the next set of books are called the historical books, the history. And those books contain a detailed history of Israel. And they're the next 12 books of the Old Testament. And so we see Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 
First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. In those books are also contained the non-writing prophets. Now we're going to get to some prophetic books here in a minute. We know there are prophetic books in the Old Testament and a lot of them, but we have certain prophets who were described in the Old Testament, but they actually did not write their works. And so Samuel, Nathan, Elijah, and Elisha are non-writing prophets, and we find their stories and chronicles in the history books. Well, and these history books detail the history of Israel. That's right, Mike, yes. And so that's why sometimes you'll see overlap between the history books and some of the things that are written in the prophetic books. So what's the next section of books in the Old Testament? Well, the next section is referred to as poetry or wisdom literature. You can see how they would be considered poetry because we have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Well, we know that, for instance, Proverbs has wise counsel for us. Yes. <laughs> well, in Psalms, too. And I've heard it said that if you want to know how to deal with God, read Psalms. If you want to know how to deal with other people, read Proverbs. We learn so much from those wisdom books. They're so rich. And Ecclesiastes was a book that was actually written by Solomon. He wrote most of the Proverbs. His father, David, wrote most of the Psalms or many of the Psalms. And then Job actually is deemed to be the oldest written material in the Bible. It's not first in its placement, but it is deemed to be the oldest. And we don't even actually have a date for the writing of the book of Job, but it is deemed to predate the writing of the book of Genesis. Wow, that's interesting. Of course, Job can be a tough read with what all he went through. Well, Laura, what's the next section of books in the Old Testament? Mike, the next division of books in the Old Testament are the books of the prophets. So we have two major groups in the prophetic books. We have five major prophets, and we have 12 minor prophets. So the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And the minor prophets are everything from Hosea through Malachi, which is the end of the Old Testament. Well, Laura, what makes the major prophets major and the minor prophets minor? <laughs> well, that's a great question, Mike. The major prophets, the works are substantial. I mean, they're meaty. The prophets spoke within a specific time range. We're not getting into it today, but it is available. If you look up the time of the writing of the prophets, you can see if they were writing to the kingdom of Israel, or they were writing to the kingdom of Judah. You can see who their kings were that they were speaking to, who the peoples were. You can see what was happening in the culture at the time, whether they were facing war or famine or judgment of God or any of those things. So the major prophets are meaty. The books are very long. They're heavily weighted. Isaiah, for example, has 66 chapters. Jeremiah has 52 chapters. Ezekiel has 48 chapters. And Daniel just has 12 chapters. But the content of the book of Daniel is so rich. And Daniel is a prophetic book that speaks to the end times. So we have a lot of our revelation about the heavenly realm in the book of Daniel. We also have a lot of revelation about things that have not yet come to pass in the book of Daniel. Now, Lamentations was a book that was written by the prophet Jeremiah, and it's just his sadness over what is happening just how he laments or cries over what what is happening to the people. And it's just five chapters, but it's a writing of Jeremiah, so it comes right on the heels of Jeremiah. Laura, that's interesting. And, of course, all of these prophets speak, and many things have been revealed in the New Testament. Yes, Mike. Actually, from the end of the book of Malachi through the beginning of the New Testament era, 
there is what we know is 400 years of silence where there were not any prophets who wrote or spoke during that time frame. So we get to the New Testament and we also have divisions of the New Testament. So the first four books of the New Testament are known as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know, Laura, that's pretty amazing that there's 400 years of silence. And thinking about that plus the time period that was covered for all the writings of the Old Testament and all the writings of the New Testament, that they even got brought together to be compiled into what we know as the Holy Bible. So 400 years was a long time. And the fact that after 400 years, that those materials were still maintained in a way that they could be brought together into what we have as the Holy Bible. Well, yes, Mike, and we'll talk about how that came to be. But we do get into the New Testament, and after 400 years of silence, there is another prophetic voice that emerges, and that voice is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, even though he is found in the Gospels, he is the last prophet of the Old Covenant. But when we get into the Gospels, Mike, the first four books of the New Testament, the Gospels tell the life and times of Jesus Christ. The Gospels are so important to us. They show the works of Jesus. They show the miracles of Jesus. They tell us about his birth, the situations of his life, of his death, of his resurrection. So the Gospels are very important to us. And I often tell people when they want to start reading the Bible for the first time is to start with one of the Gospels. Sometimes people want to go to the book of Genesis and pick it up and start reading there. And those first five books of the Old Testament are kind of hard to get through. They're great materials. I love Genesis. I love Exodus. Leviticus and uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy are a little hard to wade through. But if you want to start, start with one of the Gospels or the book of Psalms. But also it's important to remind our listeners that you don't go just with the New Testament because the Old Testament works with the New Testament to provide the full story. Yes, that's right, Mike. And until you really get in it, you don't really see how the times and seasons, the events of the Old Testament are really explained in the New Testament. Well, that's right. Well, Laura, what's the next section of the New Testament? Well, Mike, the next section of the New Testament's really short. It's the book of Acts, and it is the history of the Christian church. It's also known as the Acts of the Apostles. It's just one book. Uh, it's a great book. But then after that, we get into the epistles. The word epistle means letter. These are letters to either individuals or they're letters to churches, and they circulated around to several churches, or they were written to a particular individual. So we have the Pauline epistles, which are the letters that were written by the Apostle Paul to specified churches or uh, people under his tutelage. Those books are everything from the book of Romans down through the book of Philemon. Well, just why don't you, for our listeners, list what those books are? Mike, the letters that were written by the Apostle Paul were Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Timothy, Titus, and Philemon were books that were written to individuals. Well, are those were the epistles written by Paul? Were there other epistles in the New Testament? Mike, there are the general epistles. The first one is the book of Hebrews, and it is a book that is written to Jewish Christians. Some people want to attribute the authorship of Hebrews to Paul, but we really don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews is different in its literary style than the other Pauline epistles or the other epistles written by Paul. So we don't really know who wrote that. So then there were seven letters that were written to Christians generally that were named after the other writers. And so there were many people by this time who were Christians, but they came as Gentiles they came as non-Jewish believers. That's why we have these other general epistles that are just written to Christians. And so those are James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 
1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Jude. Which takes me to the last book of the Bible, and that is the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation is the only prophetic book in the New Testament. The book of Revelation, as we know, it's it also is very challenging to read. It's very challenging to understand, but it is a prophetic book. It was written by the Apostle John when he had been exiled on the Isle of Patmos at the end of his life. It's also a very interesting book of Scripture. Laura, there's lots of imagery in the book of Revelation, and some of it is hard to understand. Mike prophecy is challenging, but, you know, it comes by inspiration. So at the right time, the Lord is going to reveal, okay, this means this and this means that. And so we're going to know what those things mean when we have a need to know them, because that's how the Lord works. Well, Laura, let's talk about the timing of the writings of uh, the Old New Testament. Job is considered to be the oldest writing in the Old Testament, and its date is unknown. But the first writings of the Old Testament are deemed to be between 1445 to 1405 B.C., before Common Era. When we get to the time of the change, we start counting forward, but in the Old Testament, we're counting backward. We count backward till about the time we get to Jesus, and then we start counting forward. So when you're looking at 1400, then you start counting down, and the last book of the Old Testament was deemed to be Nehemiah. It was written between 424 and 400 BC. So basically, we have about a thousand years of writing of the Old Testament. Laura, I just have to say that's incredible to stop and think. And I don't know how many of our listeners realize that, but to think that the contents of the Old Testament were written over a period of a thousand years. I know, Mike, and to think that there is a common thread that is woven through that entire collection of writings, it's amazing that the first authors connected with the last authors. And we mentioned earlier there was a period of 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, the New Testament was written, and remember what I said, from the Old Testament writing we're counting backwards because we're we're, it's it's bc time then we get to 80 time it's not really what it means but a lot of people say bc means before christ a lot of people say ad means after death those are not really the technical meanings but generally speaking it does kind of help the listener to understand what we're talking about so we get to the time of the New Testament, Jesus lived from about 3 B.C. to about 30 A.D. The research that I did, those books were written from about 50 to 100. And so when you take the thousand years of the Old Testament, you take the 400 years of silence, and then you take the 100 years to get to the end of the writing of the New Testament, you have about a 1,500-year period. Laura, I thought you said the New Testament was written over a period of about 50 years. Mike, it was written over a period of about 50 years, but the 50 years didn't start until around 50. So it went from 50 to 100. So if you're looking just at the chronological time of the writing of the Bible, if it started about 1400 B.C., and it goes through about 100 A.D., it's about a 1,500-year period. Wow. That's very incredible just to think that, number one, that those writings were written across that vast span of time. And as you said, they fit together the way they do. So it's just incredible that it came about in that way. And it's understandable why the Bible is the biggest selling, most distributed book on the planet. Yes, of all times. Well, Laura, what is the Bible? It is a collection of writings, and the word Bible comes from the Greek word biblia, which means books, plural. 
you know, it is a collection of writings that tell a singular grand story. And we see, too, that it's written by 40 human authors. It's written over many cultures. It's written on three different continents. It has a large variety of writing styles and genres. We have narratives. We have poetry. We have a lot of different things in the way that the styles come together. So I guess the question is, how did it all come together? Well, Laura, let me ask this, because we talked about how the writing of the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, with the period of silence, was about 1,500 years. But actually, the stories that we find in the 66 books of the Bible actually occurred over at least 4,000 years of human history. At least 4,000 years, and maybe probably longer than that. We don't even really know how long the book of Genesis goes back, for example. We don't really know when the creation was. Well, Laura, how did all this come together? I mean, how were the writings of 40 different authors over thousands of years gathered into one book? Well, Mike, as we mentioned, there was a lot of history before things were actually written. You say, how were those things preserved? Those stories, the stories of Genesis, for example, were preserved by oral tradition, and they were passed down from generation to generation, with each generation adding its own story to the line. You know, they didn't even have means of writing in those times where there was the way to actually preserve that. Writing forms began to develop, and by then there were means of writing in terms of ink and things to write on. They did not have paper as we have it. They couldn't go to Walmart and buy a ream of paper. Original scriptures were written on papyrus, which was a reed that was woven together, and then it was pounded flat while it was wet, and then it was put out to dry. It was a reed that grew in the water. And then the other material that they used to preserve these writings on was called vellum, which was made from animal skins. So the vellum actually has a lot more longevity than the papyrus reeds, but those writings of both the Old and the New Testament have been found, and they have been preserved. So you can see the papyrus and the vellum at many museums. Actually, I went to the Museum of the Bible not too long ago in Washington, D.C. You know, you can see evidences of both of those things there. How those things were preserved is they were written down. And then when they started to wear out, they were scribed to other people and copies were made so you have copies of copies so anyway it's a little bit confusing but let me just say this they started by writing them down and then copies were made right now there are at least 5300 scrolls or partial scrolls of both the old and the new testament There are a lot of evidences of writings of what those words were of the original scriptures. Laura, that's pretty amazing to think about that many copies of the Holy Bible or portions of it written on scrolls. You said over 5,000. And I think for me today, if, if you were to say, Mike, why don't you sit down and rewrite the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation? I don't know that I could do it. Exactly, Mike. The Old Testament books were originally written in Hebrew. And even before the birth of Jesus Christ, the Hebrew scriptures were translated into the Greek language because by this time, the Greek language had arisen. And so they called the Greek translation of the Old Testament the Septuagint. The New Testament scriptures were written in Greek. Let me just give you a little bit of history about how the books were compiled, how they decided what books went into the Holy Bible. And we know from 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is inspired by God. 
So we have to also believe that the collection process of what books actually went into Scripture was also inspired by God. So, Mike, the New Testament era was up in full swing and running wide open about A.D. 100. The people who had not followed Jesus and they were really worried that these new teachings of Jesus and Paul were going to pollute the Old Testament. So they gathered together and decided which were the Hebrew scriptures that they needed to preserve intact. So about A.D. 100, the Old Testament canon it's called the process of canonization, where they decided, the leaders at the time decided, these are our scriptures. And they did that after the death of Jesus Christ, actually, because they did not want the Hebrew scriptures to be distorted by the new writings and things that were going around. So actually, the same thing happened in the gathering of the New Testament. So we have the New Testament era where the books were written from about A.D. 50 to A.D. 100, well, along about the second and third centuries, heresy started to emerge. False teachings and false doctrines started to emerge. Just like the gatherers of the Old Testament, the gatherers of the New Testament were worried that the New Testament scriptures were going to be distorted by false teaching and false doctrine. They were trying to decide what writings were actually to be included in the scriptures. For about 300 years, from about A.D. 100 to A.D. 400, the early church leaders and councils were debating the New Testament writings and which should be considered part of the New Testament. About A.D. 367, the Bishop of Alexandria, who was named Athanasius, wrote a letter that he listed 27 books that he said Christians should consider as authoritative. And those were the 27 books of the New Testament. So between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have a total of 66 books of the Holy Bible. Laura, how have we gotten so many translations? Well, Mike, originally the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. There was also a Greek translation of the Old Testament that was the earliest translation, and it was known as the Septuagint. Mike, in about A.D. 383, a pope asked the priest named Jerome to translate the Bible into Latin, and that was the Roman language. So Jerome took 27 years to translate the Bible into Latin. And so basically, if you did not know how to speak and read Latin, which was the language of the educated people, you could not have access to the Bible. So later, people started translating the Bible into common language. The King James Version was commissioned by King James about 1611 and uh, then other versions were translated and actually Mike today the Bible has been translated into thousands of languages but there are still so many languages that do not have their own translation of the Bible so there are still a lot of people groups who do not have access to the Bible in their own language. Well, Laura, I've enjoyed this discussion about the Bible. It's pretty amazing that God brought all these writers together over all these thousands of years to give us our book that gets us through life. Well, let's close with a prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for another day of life. Lord, thank you for the Bible, the Holy Scripture that we have in our hands, where we live in a country where we're free to have our Bible and to read our Bible and to proclaim that we're Christians publicly and not end up in prison. Lord, we pray for freedom for the people all around the world that are Christians, that are believers, that believe the Holy Word of God. Lord, we place all of this in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Till next week, God bless. God bless you. Thank you for listening to this edition of Where He Leads Me with Mike and Laura Harris. To find out more, 
go to wherehealeadsme.org or email Mike and Laura at wherehealeadsmeinfo at gmail.com.